And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, SRMs or small renal masses, right? And uh, we all know that over the past several de decades, because of the widespread use of uh, imaging, uh, the number of RCCs discovered or identified has increased significantly. And you can see in this graph that uh, from 1975 to 2005, the new diagnosed cases have gone up significantly. But what is interesting is the bottom half of the graph, which shows that the, uh, there has not been a reciprocal fall in mortality, because you expect that if you diagnose more cases or early cases, you should decrease the chances of uh, death from RCC. So somehow that has not happened. We need to remember one more important thing. Uh, and this is a lesson that we have learned from prostate cancer as well, is that if we have detected, if we have detected a cancer, uh, it is not necessary that we should treat it as well. Uh, and this is, this is a very important lesson that we have learned from prostate cancer. And now we are learning from the kidney cancer as well. So this is a scenario, a 75 year old male, uh, and you can see in this scan uh, that there is a partly endophytic, 50% endophytic, 50% exophytic tumor on the posterior part of the uh, left kidney. And this is, seems quite nice and amenable to partial nephrectomy. Uh, you can see the uh, the coronal reconstructed image as well, in which this is a significantly exophytic tumor. The only problem is its proximity to the, to the renal hilum, as there is only hilar fat between it and the vessels. So barring that, there is not much complexity in this tumor and uh, seems like a pretty operable uh, disease. Now this gentleman is uh, hypertensive and he's diabetic. So the question that he has is, can I be placed on active surveillance? And the second question is that, is the risk of active surveillance different based upon size? So this is about a three centimeter tumor, a T1A disease. And the sec third question is, that will the biopsy provide helpful information? Okay, so anyone who is in favor of active surveillance in this patient, please raise hand or say yes through your chat. Okay. Quite a few yes so far. Now, the second question is that, uh, is the risk of active surveillance different based on size? Those who think no can just drop their hands or if they think that yes, keep the hand raised. So we have quite a few responses saying that uh, it is based on size. Now, the third question is that will a biopsy provide helpful information? Would you biopsy this patient before putting you on active surveillance? So I see that uh, except for Shweb and Arsalan, the rest have dropped their hands, right? So Arsana as well. So except for these, no, Sana has dropped. No, no, Sana, Sana's hand is up. Kaleem, you also think that biopsy will be helpful in this situation? Yes, sir. Okay. So some of you think that biopsy is helpful. Majority thinks that biopsy is not really required. Okay, let's, let's analyze these things. Uh, in, in, uh, in the next few slides, we'll see uh, how differently we want to answer these questions. So remember that treatment is not without hazards. And we are not talking about uh, cancer-related hazards. We are not talking about acute complication, uh, the first 30-day complication. We are talking about hazards which are more long-term, right? 
Now look at this uh, this data, and from two very significant studies, which show that both partial and radical nephrectomy are harmful and can significantly uh, increase the chances of renal events. And renal events, as, uh, as a nephrological term, is defined as need for dialysis, nephrology referral, or even need for transplantation, then matched controls. So if this is partial nephrectomy versus non-cancer, and this is radical nephrectomy versus non-cancer, both have increased risk uh, compared to controls. And if you look at uh, the, these graphs, you can see that compared to benign tumors, the renal malignancy treatment causes increased chances of ESRD, which is end-stage renal disease uh, per year by the cause and uh, compared to traumatic surgical loss. So even traumatic surgical loss is, is much less development of ESRD than the renal malignancy treatment. So remember that cancer treatment, be it partial nephrectomy or radical nephrectomy, increases the chances of ESRD. And also remember that, uh, that partial nephrectomy has relatively less chances compared to radical nephrectomy, but not compared to controls. Now, what about uh, active surveillance? So this is small renal masses, over 200, uh, um, and the mean follow-up was about over two years. The average growth rate is uh, about one millimeter per year and local progression in about 12% and metastatic potential of very low 1.1%. So small renal masses, and we're talking about T1A cancers. And uh, if, if they follow for over two years, we see that uh, the growth rate is about one millimeter per year. And the local progression rate is one in 10. And if, if we look at this graph, the difference between benign and uh, an RCC is not much different. So uh, the tumors which are benign or malignant, they have a very similar growth rate. So small renal tumors behave more like benign tumors. Now, um, the second question in that scenario that we discussed was about Uh, was about uh, the relationship of metastases with the size. So if you look at zero to one centimeter versus one to two or two to three, so up to three centimeters, the potential for metastases is quite low. But once the size increases from three to four and beyond four, so T1B cancers are something that you probably would not consider managing by active surveillance because there is significant chances of metastases. Now, when you have a patient uh, and you want to make a decision whether you want to treat them by surgery or you want to treat them by active surveillance, there are certain factors that you looked at. And these factors are related to the patient factor, which obviously includes the comorbidities, life expectancy, and you can develop, uh, determine the comorbidity index. Uh, you can also determine what is called the frailty index, which means that how frail a patient is irrespective of age. So all 70 years old are not the same. Some 70 year old are, um, are, are better than the other 70 years old. So frailty index is something that determines, and this is a three point and a, and a longer index, uh, which is available and you can fill that index and determine how frail a patient is uh, at, at, at that particular age. Sana, you have a question? You have raised his, your hand. Okay. Now, the second important thing that we looked at is the tumor factor or oncological potential of uh, cancer. 
uh, whether it's a solid mass or a solid cystic mass. The imaging factors, the complexity of tumors, if there is a prior imaging, how uh, the tumor has grown between two consecutive imagings. And have we done a biopsy and do we know what subtype grade uh, this tumor is and if there are any molecular factors that we have to look into. Again, uh, the management factors are also important. If you have um, uh, the, the American College of Surgeon and Nescope data indicates that there are centers which can perform laparoscopic or robotic or open partial nephrectomies or radical nephrectomies much more safely. So uh, you also have to see at your center, what is the morbidity of uh, an intervention? So if the morbidity of intervention is high in your center compared to a recognized morbidity of intervention around the world, then uh, you probably have to think twice before moving from active surveillance <clears throat> to uh, interventional treatment. So the basic question that you need to answer or the theme or philosophy on which you need to work is first do no harm, right? Kisne kaha tha ye? Socrates, sir. Socrates. Did you say Socrates? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you all agree? So no, which one of the, of the three gentlemen uh, I'll name? The three great Greek philosophers and scholars, Socrates, Pluto, and uh, Hippocrates. 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 Hippocrates, okay. Hippocrates, the one whose, whose oath we take. Uh, have you taken the oath at the time of graduation on the Hippocratic, uh, what's called the Hippocratic oath? Has anyone yes, read sir. that? Yes, sir. Yes. Everyone, sir. Everyone has read it. Oh, really? Interesting. Excellency. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now based upon these uh, three areas, we need to make a decision. And the decisions are made. Uh, modern day decision making is communication and shared decision making. So you need to explain to the patient uh, the pros and cons of both and let the patient decide. So it's easier now. But obviously it takes uh, a, a lot more time than uh, you would go and say, well, aapka operation hoga. So active surveillance um, and expectant management as in prostate cancer is also different in renal cancer, the frequency of imaging uh, and the imaging modality is different in the two, two groups. So if you're on active surveillance, uh, every three to six months, you would have a cross-sectional imaging, uh, preferably with a CT scan or an MRI scan or um, in certain situation, ultrasound if indicated. But in expectant management, you would probably do uh, imaging uh, not once, uh, once or twice a year, not every three months. And uh, most of the time, the imaging is uh, ultrasound. And uh, there are very nice data. I think I've shared it in one of the previous presentation uh, about uh, the use of contrast-enhanced ultrasound shown as good as cross-sectional imaging in the follow-up patient of kidney cancers. The potential for trigger. So what causes need for intervention. So when do you decide that you have to do an intervention now compared to uh, continuation of active surveillance? Uh, if the size increases to greater than three centimeters, and we have shown that between three and four centimeters, the chances of uh, metastases increases, and after four centimeters, the chances increases significantly. So one of the trigger is that the size increases beyond three centimeters. If there is a stage progression, so if you've done biopsy, and the Furman or WHO grade has moved from low to high, one to two, then two to three, you need to probably think in terms of uh, intervention. Kinetics means the, uh, the rate of growth of prostate cancer. If it is not one millimeter, it is greater than five millimeter per year, then obviously you have to think in terms of, so it was three centimeters last year, 2.5 centimeter last year and three this year. It's about five millimeter increase in size, and that patient probably would need um, active treatment. 
Yeah. So the in, in, in how we're in expectant management, uh, you would not use the same triggers and you will be using a uh, trigger like uh, development of metastatic. Uh, and then obviously you would intervene. Now, in response to the last question that I ask, I share some data from a, a nice paper published in Neurological Oncology um, uh, about two, three years back. And they have looked at for SRMs, the metastatic potential in various different types of kidney cancers. So clear cell carcinoma, papillary, chromophobe, and non-specified RCCs. And you can see that for non-specific uh, non-specified RCCs, the potential for metastases is, is higher. Second is clear cell carcinoma, uh, papillary tumors is this graph. And, uh, and for the chromophobe, it's the lowest potential. So chromophobe is a good histology. So uh, if you have chromophobe versus you have RCC of non-specified type, uh, there is a huge difference in the malignant potential, even at two centimeters, uh, uh, at four centi two centimeters, probably not that much, three centimeters, not that much, but once you are close to four centimeters, uh, the, this graph is going up quite exponentially compared to chromophobe, which is not going as much. Okay, so the chances of metastases in SRMs, the small renal tumors, is not just size dependent, it's also dependent upon the histology. And what are the various adverse pathological features? And uh, those who are interested uh, should also go and look at this GRU presentation by Peter Schulman uh, on, on adverse pathological features. And I can send link if you guys are interested. So if you have rhabdoid and sarcomatoid feature, lymphovascular invasion, coagulative necrosis, high-grade WHO or Furman 3 or 4, sinus or perinephric fat invasion, and papillary type 2. Uh, so papillary type 1 is, is, is relatively slow going, whereas papillary type 2 is a fast growing. So if you have any of these, and if you have a combination of the two, then you are at a higher risk of metastases. Now look at this data. And this is interesting that for a size of one centimeter, if you have one adverse pathological feature, the um, chances of, uh, sorry. So if you have a one centimeter tumor, the chances of presence of adverse pathological feature is low. And as the size increases, these adverse pathological features and their incidence also increases. Now, if you look at the Kaplan-Meier curve, that if you have one pathological, adverse pathological feature, and we have told you these adverse pathological features a couple of slides back, versus you have greater than two adverse pathological features, the, the death rate from cancer or disease-specific survival is different. And as you can see, that the Kaplan-Meier curve are quite divergent. And this broken line is for greater than two, or equal to a greater than two adverse pathological features. The chances of dying is close to, is about 90%, whereas uh, this is more than 95%, okay? Uh, disease specific survival. So, so far from this data, we have to now look at these questions again and try and answer these questions. So first question, raise your hands. Uh, and then if you don't uh, agree with the second one, drop your hand. So the first question again is that uh, this gentleman is asking the question whether he can be placed on active surveillance. So all of you believe that uh, this is he can be placed on active surveillance, 75 year old, diabetic, hypertensive, three centimeter uh, left renal tumor. 
So quite a few of you think uh, that, yes, they can be placed on active surveillance. This, the second question was, is the risk of active surveillance based on size? Those who think no can drop their hands and those who think yes, keep their hands up. Right, the third question uh, to which we had mixed response was, will the biopsy likely to provide helpful information? And only two or three of you believe that it does. Whereas now, uh, quite a few of you believe that it does. Okay. So we have learned something this morning. Yeah. Wonderful. Are, are you still able to see my slides? Uh, have I? Yes. yes. Right, so let's, let's move. Let's move to what would you do if you intervene? And when you intervene, you intervene very likely for SRMs by partial nephrectomy. So let's talk a little bit about partial nephrectomy. So this is a book on which I contributed one of the chapters on uh, management of small renal masses uh, published from London by Springer. And um, we all know that the trifecta is no complication, negative surgical margins, and warm ischemia time of less than 25 minutes. And if you look at the pentafacta, meaning that five features that we need to uh, attain in doing a fair job while doing a, um, a partial nephrectomy is that greater than 90% preservation of the estimated GFR. So if your GFR was 50, it should stay above 45 after, at one year after partial nephrectomy. The fifth point in pentafacta, besides the three above point, is there is no stage upgrade of chronic kidney disease. We know that CKD is, uh, is graded from one to four or one to five. Uh, and uh, at one year, the CKD, if it was two, it should stay on two rather than becoming three, okay? The goals of open partial nephrectomy is obviously the complete removal of the cancer, which is obviously the first goal in all situations. Uh, the technique is quite standardized, uh, preoperative multidisciplinary care with the involvement of uh, the nephrologist right in the beginning is, is important because as I have shown you in the initial slides, that there are significant chances of, of development of, um, of CKD and ESRD in, in these situations, okay? Right, so what we see here is this is a non-contrast and this is a contrast enhanced CT scan and a small renal tumor about 2.5 centimeters, about 50% endophytic, uh, quite peripheral present anteriorly and uh, if uh, he is a 50 year old person what would you do? And if he's a 80 year old person, what would you do? I think from whatever we have discussed so far, the decision is quite easy. So whenever you see such small renal tumor, the first question is whether you want to do surveillance or you want to do treatment. The second question is that if you decide for a treatment, what kind of treatment would you do? So, radical nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy versus thermal ablation. And we know that uh, RFA and microwave thermotherapy and uh, cryo are, are some of the modalities which are available for these kind of tumors. The third question is that if you decide for a surgical approach, uh, would it be open versus minimally invasive uh, nephrectomy? And we'll see how we take these decisions. So the decisions about treatment care is made on certain factors and some of the, these we have discussed. 
uh, we need to do a job which is has high oncological efficacy. We need to do a job which would preserve nephron as much as possible. And we need to do a job which minimizes the treatment morbidity and burden of chronic disease in these patients. And whenever you take these decisions, your mind should start working automatically. You don't have to look, really look at the algorithms when you are in a clinic and making a decision about a patient. Your, your mind should have all these things and you filter out information and take a decision, okay? So patient's age, comorbidity index, if there are familial predisposition or some genetic disorders which can cause recurrent cancers, all these factors are important. And uh, can the patient be uh, stay on anticoagulants or antiplatelet therapy, uh, or he can be stopped? Uh, that's again a significant, what is the status of the contralateral kidney? What are the various comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes, which are extremely common in this age? Uh, has there been any prior surgery? So minimally invasive surgical options may become what is COVID risk. Uh, uh, can you turn off the audio, please? Mel, who is Mel? Uh, Dr. Math, you'll have the option to mute this person. Uh, how can I do that? Okay, you've been sensible enough. Okay, um, again, uh, the other important questions is uh, race and the socioeconomic status, uh, surgeon's skill set and experience in doing. Uh, so if, if you are not good in partial nephrectomy doing laparoscopically and you can do a good job open surgery, then it's fine. I mean, you do an open surgical, but do a good job uh, attaining these three uh, uh, important uh, goals of treatment, okay? So decision point one, newly diagnosed small renal cancer, you want to do active surveillance, you want to do treatment. If you have decided in terms of treatment, again, uh, these are the three options. If you've decided for partial or radical nephrectomy, whether it's open, minimal invasive, lap or robotic. So, this is how you move down the treat decision ladder. Now, as we have said, that uh, the small renal tumors can also be uh, managed by active surveillance. And we have talked about this in a little greater detail previously. So I will just skip that. And uh, this is the article by Bertelli, World Journal of Urology, published 2021. Uh, in which they have looked at uh, the follow-up of, uh, this is the one that I was referring to, by um, contrast-enhanced ultrasound, so using the microbubbles. Uh, and this is nearly as good as CT scan. So obviously CT scan would decrease the chances of contrast nephropathy, as well as decreases the chances of uh, radiation to the patient uh, that uh, you can use a good quality CEUS or contrast-enhanced ultrasound. So various modalities for partial nephrectomy. Well, between laparoscopic and open partial nephrectomy, no difference in progression-free survival and overall survival. Uh, the mean blood loss is lower in laparoscopy, which is understandable. Post-operative morbidity and mortality are similar. The operative time is a little longer in, the, in lab and the warm ischemia time is shorter with the open approach. So again, this is some of the factors which are important. This is so somebody has a borderline kidney function and uh, you want to do a lap partial nephrectomy, you need to remember that even if you can do a lap or a robot assisted uh, or open, uh, you make the decision in favor of open approach because this patient is very likely to be uh, managed with a short warm ischemia time with an open approach compared to other approaches. So that's, that's an important decision that you need to take. 
open versus robot assisted uh, comparable uh, oncological efficacy in the cases of uh, higher tumor like t1b and up to t3a the robot assisted partial is superior to open in terms of lower estimated blood loss and shorter hospital stay the warm ischemia time operative time immediate early and short complications creatinine are all very similar in the two groups so uh there is not a huge difference between this uh, except for the early recovery and less uh, blood loss in uh, uh, minimally invasive approaches compared to open approach so these are some of the rcts and i don't think that we can need to go into the details of that so this is an interesting article um and uh, this was uh published in european urology oncology last year and they have looked at uh, the cardiovascular issues following partial nephrectomy and uh, the conclusion from this multi center study is that uh, nephron sparing surgery is an independent protective effect on hypertension but not on other myocardial uh, uh, morbidities so development of other morbidities uh, are not affected by uh, partial nephrectomy but the chances of hypertension development is uh, is less if you undergo a, a nephron sparing surgery if you look at uh, some of the data uh, in the last few years you can see that uh, the number of partial nephrectomies has increased from 2004 to 2013 the number of radical nephrectomies is going down then obviously they will reach a certain plateau uh, because there are specific indication for but some of the cancers that can be treated by partial nephrectomy previously were being treated by radical nephrectomy and now um, and uh, this is if you look at the division in terms of size uh, for 2 cent 2 cm tumors again uh, the 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 curves are diverging so you have uh, more and more partials than uh, radical nephrectomies for 2 cm 2.1 to 4 and even for 4 cm cancers so the aua guidelines um, this 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 interesting study has looked at the utilization of partial nephrectomy prior to the aua guidelines about partial nephrectomy versus uh, the uh, uh, before the guidelines and then uh, they have seen that the total number of uh, uh, partial nephrectomies in the two era were not very different so even before the aua guidelines the partial nephrectomies were being considered as better um, so there are higher chances of a patient undergoing a partial nephrectomy if it is being done with an open approach if the surgeon has high volumes for partial nephrectomies and if the patients are younger now the central question about uh, about preservation of kidney function after partial nephrectomy is that what is your preoperative kidney function the what is the quality of parenchyma which was preserved so if you have a poor functioning kidney overall and you have done a partial nephrectomy uh, and the rest of the parenchyma is not really good enough uh, there would not be much impact on development of esrd and uh, what was the nephron recovery after ischemic insult so again the kind of ischemic insult which was given versus uh, the duration of the warm ischemia are all important factors so uh, the preoperative gfr again is an indicator the parenchyma preserved tumor size and complexity warm ischemia time and the healthy parenchyma off clamp or selective minimal renal ischemia techniques are obviously better than complete ischemia which means that you do renal artery and vein both uh, and if you do only renal artery versus no vein it's better than both uh, uh, renal artery and vein 
And if you do only a selective clamping of the parenchyma uh, where the tumor is being resected and can easily be done for polar tumors, then obviously it is better than the uh, renal vein only. So this is a busy uh, diagram which looks at various uh, surgeon related versus various uh, patient related factors. So it's, it's a complex uh, thing that how partial nephrectomies uh, can actually uh, preserve the renal function. I'm not going into the details, some of which we have discussed. So how do you do a partial nephrectomy? And I think this is one question that we need to look at quite carefully. This is a simple enucleation, and this simple enucleation is often what is required. And this is best in terms of preservation of the kidney function because you have hardly removed any, uh, any normal parenchyma. The second is enucleoresection, which means that you have removed a little rim of tissue along with the tumor. And uh, so the parenchyma loss would be minimal. And this is uh, the bed which will obviously become devascularized because you have used sutures, you have used diathermy, uh, and this will may result in loss of this part of the parenchyma. So compared to this, there is greater loss of parenchyma here. And if you have done a wedge resection, which is a traditional way of doing, there would be a significantly more parenchyma loss compared to any of these techniques. We all know that uh, the renal vasculature is uh, understanding the anatomy of the renal vasculature is a key to partial nephrectomy and the principle of uh, one four, meaning that uh, post one posterior division and uh, four anterior division is what we have. So from the upper polar division, there is an upper polar artery and then an apical artery, the middle artery and the lower artery. So there are four branches from the anterior division and one direct uh, posterior division. And there is one area, which is the avascular plane, the Brodel's line is, uh, is the area where the, there will be a watershed between these two divisions. These are some of the uh, tumors which are really difficult to manage by partial nephrectomy. And you can very well see that this is a totally endophytic tumor. And uh, most of these tumors would, uh, if undergo partial nephrectomy, would require significant dissection within the renal hilum and uh, sometimes opening up the kidney by valving the kidney. Sometimes you do bench resection Sometimes you have to do both hyalur clamping and open it up. Uh, and then uh, in a situation like this, you probably would require frozen sections uh, to make sure that you have completely dissected the tumor. So this is, this is a challenging case. And if you do not have the expertise, do not undertake this by partial nephrectomy. You're going to do more harm in this kidney would be, even if you leave some of this kidney, it would be hardly functional, okay? So you see, this, this kind of tumors are really very difficult to do by partial nephrectomy. So this, this tumor is really sitting in the center of the kidney. It's very close to the hilum. It is big. Uh, and if you, if you remove this, you have a very high risk of pedicle injuries. And that may result in a significant blast loss during the surgery and maybe even tumor spillage and all this may result in early recurrences. So these decisions should be made preoperatively and you do directly go for radical nephrectomy. The size of the tumor may still be about P1B and uh, theoretically amenable to partial nephrectomy. So sometimes you have, uh, you can do selective arterial uh, clamping, which means that if you can get hold of a division of the artery which is supplying one of the poles, then you might uh, do selective uh, clamping of that particular vessel and uh, still be able to get the rest of the kidney perfused. And as such, you would uh, be preserving significant amount of parenchyma. And still do surgery in a relative bloodless field.
So this is some of the examples of those partial that we have done uh, with selective clamping of the. So look at this. Uh, once you have isolated and removed uh, what is called the dirty fat over the tumor, you have, in this case, we have both the renal artery and vein clamped, and you can see that it's a very dry field. And this tumor was partly going into the uh, going into the uh, collecting system. So you have to cut that collecting system and remove that tumor uh, from the collecting system. Otherwise, you would do uh, a job in which the, in the collecting system, you can, can see, is being closed first. And uh, if you have a dry field, if you have no blood, uh, you can actually easily see uh, the open collecting system. You don't really need to place uh, double J stands or anything, uh, but again, depends upon your comfort. Uh, you, some people put an open-handed catheter and put methylene blue to make sure that they have removed, uh, have completely closed the collecting system. If you have not, then, uh, uh, then you have to redo and make a white water tight in estimosis, okay? And close the parenchymal defect. So, this is how the renorephy is being done. Once you have uh, removed and you have uh, closed the collecting system, then you have to take care of some of the bleeding vessels from the bed and then close the defect uh, either on bolsters or uh, without. In this situation, there is uh, the kidney was quite nicely visible, the defect, and we can approximate the kidney using the hands and tied without bolsters, but some others also can help in decreasing the chances of cut through. So are there patients who are unsuitable for partial nephrectomy? Uh, again, the question of how much of parenchyma is left. So if it's a big tumor or it's a poor functioning kidney and you hardly leave any parenchyma in that kidney, there is no point in doing a partial nephrectomy. If you have renal vein thrombosis, again, uh, partial nephrectomy is, is, is not indicated. Um, okay, so I hope all of you are aware of uh, this uh, scoring system and uh, we are going to just quickly look at this scoring system and this is uh, determining the complexity of doing a partial nephrectomy using one of the scoring system, nephrometry scoring system, which is called the renal score, which means that for R we have the radius or maximal diameter in centimeters. If it is uh, less than or equal to four, you give one point. If it is between four and seven, you give two points. If you have greater than seven, then you give three points. If it is more than 50% um, uh, exophytic, then it is one point. If it is uh, equal, two points. If it is entirely endophytic, then it's three points. The nearness to the collecting system in millimeters, and that can be determined. And I'll show you how to, how to determine all these things. Whether the tumor is anterior versus posterior, it uh, slightly makes it slightly more complicated to do a posterior, but then if you've gone through the flank approach, it is not really much of a difference between anterior and posterior. Uh, so you don't give any points, you just write AP for anterior and posterior. And uh, what is the relationship of the tumor in terms of uh, polar line? So I'll tell you how to determine all these factors. So, the uh, important, one of the most important thing is to determine the size of the tumor. And the size of the tumor can be determined by uh, using various uh, either reconstructed or axial images uh, in which you can see the entire tumor in one image. And then <clears throat> uh, determine the maximum size of the tumor. So if, if you have in this image 37 millimeter, whereas in this image 43.5 millimeter for the same tumor, these are different patients, but if it is 
and you would use the 43.5 millimeter as your, as your tumor size. How to determine 50% uh, endophytic exophytic? So you draw an imaginary line where the kidney should have been, and then see if your tumor is lying, half the tumor is lying endophytic or half is lying exophytic or whatever is the distribution. So in this situation, more than 50% of the tumor is exophytic and you would give one point. N is the nearness of the collecting system. Now, if you look at this image, it is very difficult to really uh, see the, the nearness of collecting to the collecting system of this tumor. So you find the image which the best describes the relationship with the uh, uh, with the collecting system or the renal hilum. And you can see here that this is the hilar fat and this, this tumor is really very close to the uh, hilum than um, would be shown in other films. Okay. Now look at this CT and answer the question. So The question is, uh, do you think this is anterior or posterior? Posterior. Hmm? Anterior or posterior? Posterior. Posterior. And how have you made this decision? By axial image or section? We are not showing axial image. This is reconstructed coronal yes. image. In this image, how have you determined it's yes. anterior or posterior? This we are earlier seeing anterior. the vessels anterior. and uh, we're coming from the vessels towards the other side. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, if you look again, I'll replay this uh, CT. Is that we are seeing adrenal gland here and uh, we are moving. And once we start moving, we start seeing this tumor more and more. And once we come to that stage, we start seeing this bowel as well, small bowel. Yeah. So this is anterior. So this is anterior. Sir. Anterior. Thank you very much. So this is a one question that you need to ask for your renal scoring system, whether the tumor is anterior or posterior. And uh, you can use axial section and that makes life very easy. That you draw a line from the renal hilum bisecting the kidney. And if the tumor is above that line, it's anterior. If it is below that line, it's posterior. Okay, see another CT. Question is which pole is RCC? Upper pole or lower pole? Close to the upper pole or the lower pole or it is in the middle? Starting from the middle pole, more close to the lower pole. So, when you look at this axial section and it's scrolling down, you are moving from above downwards. Agreed? Close to the lower pole. So, how to determine on an aesthetic picture whether the tumor is lateral, uh, is, is upper pole, middle pole, or lower pole, is that you draw a line from the uh, medial lip of parenchyma at the renal hilum, another line from the inferior lip of the parenchyma at the renal hilum, 
and see whether tumor is lying above this line, below this line, or uh, in the middle, in, the, in between these two lines, or it is crossing those lines. So if it is, this is clearly an upper polar tumor. This is predominantly upper polar tumor. This is clearly a, low, a middle polar tumor. And this is more middle than lower polar, clear? So the point distribution of the renal score is that the polar tumor, which is either upper or the lower pole, are less complex. And uh, the surgical complexities in nephron sparing surgery is less if you have this or this here. Uh, it is slightly more complex if it is um, upper polar but going towards the middle pole, two points. If it is predominantly middle pole or uh, then it or completely middle pole, it's three points. Okay, so is that uh, clear? If there any ambiguity? in the renal score determination. And next time when you see a CT, you can do it easily in all cases. Okay. I take silence as yes. Okay. So this is case number one, 25 year old surgical resident presented to the emergency room with dysuria and mild hemichuria and right flank iliac fossa pain. No known comorbidity. She grew uh, E. coli in her urine, was treated, and for some odd reason, they decide to do a CT scan, and the CT scan is showing this, this lesion. And you can see very clearly that there is a, this is a non-contrast enhanced CT at the moment, and there is a tumor which is lying in the posterior part, lower pole, close to the, coming to the middle pole, close to the hilum. Uh, so this is the description and the size of the tumor is uh, 30 millimeters. So T1A tumor and how would you rate the renal score for this lady? Four, five, six. So six A, six B, uh, six P, or 5A, 5P, any guesses? Most probably 5P. 5P. Okay, this is the contrast enhanced film of the, of the same person. And you can see that uh, this tumor is, if we draw a line, the kidney should have been here. So this is more 50% more exophytic, right? Or uh, in this film, you can see that it's significantly exophytic. So the size-wise, it is uh, less than four, so one. It is uh, partly exophytic, partly endophytic, 50% each, so two points here. The uh, location of the tumor is uh, very close to the middle, so they were three points here because it is uh, more than 50% in the middle area or close to the hilum. So six points. The nearness to the collecting system was not determined here. So maybe it is, it is quite close to the, uh, so three points. So it's actually nine points uh, should be. So this is, this is a, uh, how you do it. And this is her surgery. So the kidney is completely mobilized and uh, you can see the uh, vascular clamps. This is Rommel type of vascular clamps, uh, which is holding both the renal artery and vein. And uh, this is complete ischemia because I expect to do this thing within 12 to 15 minutes. So uh, there is no point in having a wet field. And you see, I don't use any, any thermal devices. So it's all blunt and uh, sharp dissection using scissors. Uh, I use a significant amount of my thumb to mobilize this tumor uh, because this is nicely, most of these tumors are very nicely encapsulated. So you mobilize them, try and lift them up in the natural plane that has been created by the tumor. Uh, whenever there is resistance, you use uh, scissors 
to dissect it out. So you can see that a bit of a rim of a parenchyma and uh, the part of the collecting system was opened as you can see a little uh, black hole here and uh, this would be closed separately first and then uh, hemostasis here and then you would do the renal, renal therapy. Okay, so this is the renal bad area. And once you have uh, closed this, you would open the hilum and then close the defect. Okay. So very nicely encapsulated, don't see any breach, bit of a parenchyma, it's more of a enuclear resection rather than a pure enucleation. Uh, this is the uh, external fat on the tumor. Okay, so partial nephrectomies, we have about 15 minutes. So let's quickly talk about some of the complications of partial nephrectomy, and we'll talk uh, basically both lab robotic and uh, uh, open partial nephrectomies complication. And uh, this is the uh, data from Indabir Gill, the famous uh, robotic surgeon in the US. And uh, they have looked at uh, the complication rate and it's about 10% uh, complication rate for a large series of patients. Similar data from uh, Ross Weiler, uh, a German urologist, and uh, the partial nephrectomy rate, uh, uh, complication rate was quoted to be about 23% uh, uh, in multi-institutional European uh, data set. Now I'm going to show you some of the, um, some of the CT scans, and uh, we're going to look at what do you see here? So this was a 48 year old male who underwent uh, right partial nephrectomy, laparoscopic. Uh, and this is an axial contrast enhanced CT scan of this patient. So what do you see in this CT scan? Do you think there is any, any, anything abnormal in this scan? this post-operative CT scan after six months of a patient who underwent a lap partial nephrectomy. Okay, so let me just uh, tell you a few things. What do you see here is this kidney is plastered or stuck to the abdominal wall, in the posterior abdominal wall here. And you can see this is a typical post-operative situation because any, any kidney which is being operated would then be adhered to the uh, abdominal wall, the posterior abdominal wall. This is typically done um, in transperitoneally. Uh, so this, this kidney has, because you dissect off all the fat from around the tumor area and uh, it becomes adhered to the abdominal wall. The second thing that you are noticing is a lot of fat here. Can you all see that fat? The black is the fat, and this fat is an indicative of uh, that the perinephric fat is used for renal renorraphy, and the defect was closed over perinephric fat. So this is a normal uh, uh, scan after surgery. Okay, so this is another scan, and uh, this was a 62-year-old female who underwent a left partial nephrectomy. And you can see this is the tumor for which she underwent a partial nephrectomy, spleen here, the kidney here, and this is her tumor. And uh, this is a post-operative scan. So does anyone want to comment on this? Uh, this is an MRI scan. Uh, this is a CT scan. So this is uh, an MRI scan after surgery. And this is a coronal T2 weighted MR image about six months after surgery. And uh, what does it demonstrate?
Oh, there's complete yes. silence. Is it adhered to the spleen on that side, on the side of your section? Uh, I mean, it, it seems like, uh, but not really. So this, yes, I mean, you can say that it was very close to the, but uh, not really. Anything else? So these images, images the fat wouldn't be from... black. Yeah, so you see this wedge defect. So probably a wedge resection was done in this patient. And uh, there is a bit of a scar tissue here, the upper arrow. So this is the scar tissue, which is uh, hypo intense. So th this is the scar tissue. After surgery, this is the fat within the defect. <clears throat> if you look at this MRI scan, and this is fat suppressed T1 weighted image on an MR, uh, what, what do you see here? What would be your diagnosis? This is a fat suppressed T1 weighted MR image. Um, you can see this arrow here and uh, there is a mass lesion which is very close in intensity to the perinephric fat. Right? So, yes. so, yes, very good. So, if you look at this picture and you don't know the history, <coughs> you may diagnose it as uh, angiomyolipoma. Right? Very nice. So, but if you have a history, you would know that this patient underwent a partial nephrectomy from this site, and this is fat within the defect. Okay? So uh, must be a small tumor which was completely removed and the parenchymal defect nicely closed and this is the fat within. So it's important that you provide some history to the, to the radiologist because to a radiologist, uh, there is no, nothing but uh, angiomyolipoma, okay? What about this one? This is the same patient, MR image, a different view. And this is a much larger fat here in the T1 weighted image with fat suppression. And uh, uh, so this is T2, sorry, T2 weighted image. And you can see uh, a bit of a significant amount of fat tissue here in the lower pole indicating uh, that fat was used for reconstruction. Again, very similar to the one that we have seen previously. And this is, this is all normal. This, this is all post-operative changes rather than any disease. Can somebody describe the CT scan? Do you think this is an anterior tumor or a posterior tumor? Anterior tumor. Is this uh, uh, upper polar, lower polar, or mid polar? So, so basically, polar. this is an axial uh, section uh, where we can see that it's a mid polar lesion, hypo intense lesion that is um, mainly posteriorly lying and it's right. more uh, almost endophytic. Yeah. So, this, this is a complex tumor, right? Because it is completely endophytic, it is mid polar. It is about uh, nearly four centimeters. So this, this looks like a complex uh, patient disease. And uh, this patient underwent an open partial nephrectomy. Uh, and this is what we see here. This is after surgery, about uh, six months after surgery. And uh, what do you see? Any, any, any issues? Any abnormality? Just the fat pad. Just the fat, very good. So the teaching point is that pack perinephric fat into the surgical belt help achieve hemostasis. And this is cheap and this is easily available and this is, uh, can, can be done. Uh, so fat packing material may later be mistaken for fatty mass such as angiomyolipoma. So this is the teaching point from the scan that I've shared with you. 
So some of the complications, and now this is a 76 year old male who underwent a partial nephrectomy for this mass. It's a complex cystic mass related to the middle and the lower pole um, anteriorly. And uh, after surgery, this is his CT scan. So what are your findings on the, so this is the MRI scan after surgery. Any observations, any views on the kidney, the kidney has uh, lost a lot of cortex. Yes. Uh, so, and the other thing is there is small nodule like uh, lesion appearing at the lower aspect of the kidney. Uh, this are you referring to this arrow or this arrow? The, the lower arrow? right picture, the low, lower most oh, this, arrow. This one? This one. It's not enhancing either the kidney. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this is, you're absolutely right. This is a vascular complication and uh, this patient has actually lost his left renal unit. This is a non-functioning, poorly enhanced kidney with some, oh, beg your pardon, some uh, contrast enhancement in one part of the kidney here, some upper polar bit here. So this whole area, which was operated field, has lost its vascularity and this kidney is, is really dead and dying. So this is a vascular complication. So this is a preoperative uh, CT scan of a patient. And this is the postoperative scan. What is the complication? This is a large collection behind the kidney. Yeah. It could be a urinoma, it could be a hematoma. So this was a, again a vascular complication, poor hemostasis resulting in a big hematoma, which is uh, really become infected here. And uh, this is again an uh, example of a, of a, and this, this scan was done post-operatively and you can see big, big collection. This is the preoperative uh, scan here and a big tumor which was operated. This is the MR, MR scan and you can see this, this large tumor, very hyalur, significantly endophytic. So if I draw a line from here where the kidney should have been, this is greater than 50% endophytic. This is more than four centimeters. This is a very hyalur. This is lying posteriorly. So this is a complex, significantly complex mass. And this patient uh, developed a complication and this is the complication. So what's the diagnosis? Aneurysm. Very good. So this is a pseudo aneurysm, which this patient, this lady developed after a partial nephrectomy. This is the preoperative scan, uh, and you can see this tumor here, right? And uh, this is the postoperative scan. What do we have here? So we have a breach in the collecting system, so likely uh, this is a urinoma. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, very good. So this is this is extravasation, and I'll show you another picture. So this is an IV contrast exervization, and this is in the late phase because you can see that the uh, renal pelvis on the left side, on the right side is highlighted. This is collecting system contrast, and this is not blood because this is quite late in the, uh, in the, after the injection of the contrast. So late phase uh, film which is showing some contrast in the collecting system and the contrast exervization here. So this is not a hematoma or a bleeding complication, but this is a collecting system breach. So these are the scans of a person who underwent a partial nephrectomy for the left upper polar RCC uh, about a year back, and this is what he has now.
the entire kidney has been replaced by a cystic mass like a gone kidney. entire kidney if you look at this film uh, this this is the leftover the, kidney right uh, ashay that's a post op ah uh, these are all post op right so there's a big uh, uh, collection related to the upper pole of the kidney and this collection is quite confined within the capsule so uh, there is no uh, extravasation and such but this is a confined collection after surgery and this has a potential of getting infected and you need to determine whether it's an infected or an uninfective collection uh, it's an expanding collection or it is a confined collection and then make a decision about treatment okay this is an mr scan uh, mr scan of a patient and this is the ct of the same patient and you can see this tumor here and this is the post operative uh, mr scan what is the complication looks like a recurrence localized uh, infarcted area is it an area which is not getting a blood supply localized area no yes sir this is a, a recurrent tumor so mm -hmm. this is in the bed and there is another one so there must be tumor spillage uh, incomplete resection and this has resulted in a recurrent rcc what is this this is pre operative scan this is post operative scan This one is simple. Oh, collection, confined, air specs, and abscess. No. My friend, battery is finished. You guys, you guys. Breakfast is coming. Hurry up, quickly. No. Let's go. Okay. So uh, just I'm finishing up. Uh, we are time now. Uh, positive surgical margins is another complication after uh, partial nephrectomy, and uh, fortunately, the consequence of uh, of uh, positive surgical margin are not very bad, and uh, the chances of unless there is a very significant uh, residual tumor, these tumors tend to grow very slowly and. typically does not require any any significant intervention so let's just skip that so in summary partial nephrectomy provides a valid option for t1a and t1b and some t2 cancers the oncological outcome is comparable to radical nephrectomy there is greater provision of gfr preservation and and prevention of ckd with partial nephrectomy but both can result in in uh, ckd and eas rd development uh, the technique is standardized and outcome is very similar in open versus robotic versus uh, laparoscopic partial nephrectomy and active surveillance is a good option for less than 3 cm tumors which favorable histology uh, so uh, it should be offered to patients who are elderly significant comorbidities and have less than 3 cm tumor okay so i'll stop here and uh, if there are any questions please feel free to ask otherwise we can conclude today's meeting this is just one observation yeah uh, a lot of scans that we were seeing were actually mris yes instead of cts <laughs> yeah uh, so they are typically mri scans done after surgery so the pre operative are mostly ct scans but uh, the majority of the post operative scans are mri scans and the reason is that uh, mr is unless you have renal dysfunction mr is uh, no radiation right okay so there are 19 points in the chat box uh right so dr salman thank you very much uh, for 
all your comments. So there are no questions, only praises for me. So thank you very much.